Welcome back, everyone, to another Aramaic Bible study. These Bible studies are intended for students of Semitic languages, the Aramaic dialects in particular. They're also intended for those who are interested in the Eastern Christian tradition or even Jewish studies. Sometimes we cover things like the Targum or the Old Testament in the Pshito, which is typically used by Christians but was originally a Jewish translation. Today, we will be looking at one verse from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, from his first letter to the Corinthians. And normally, I cover a little section just to highlight a, a number of different ideas. Uh, but since this is Akkadian April, we are going to be looking at some of the Akkadian words that pop up in the Aramaic language. And some of these are scriptural. So let's go ahead and begin. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 3.10. So the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 10. What I do with these studies is I read the West Syriac accent here in the white and in the Serto font, and then I read the East Syriac accent in the light blue in the Swadaya font. You'll see these fonts represented by a number of different names. Sometimes they're denominational, but I I don't know that that's fair given the historical usage of all the different communities that use these fonts. So let's begin first in the Western accent. Now in the Eastern accent. And that translates to, According to the grace of God, which was given me, I laid the foundation like a wise architect, and another builds on it. But let each one see how he builds on it. All right, there's basically two words that I think are worth pointing out here. One is taken directly from the Akkadian. The other probably has roots in Akkadian. So the first one um, seems to have some roots in Akkadian. That's shetesto, and that means a foundation. That's actually a compound word, a combination of two words. If we look at the Akkadian real quick here, it's ishtu and asitu. Ishtu is a foundation or the bottom, the base of something. It's also used for the buttocks, right? The base of something. And then asitu is a wall. Um, it's also used for a pile, right? It can be a piled wall, a pile of stones. So a pile of other things too. I mean, there's been some pretty gnarly historical ways in which this word has been used uh, that you know I don't think are worth bringing up, but they have to do with um, very unpleasant things that have happened in human history for making uh, walls out of certain body parts. So um, all that to say, it's basically a way of heaping a wall. And if you've, I don't know if you've ever laid concrete or you've made a foundation with something, you often take pieces of concrete or stones even sometimes, that's aggregate, right? You put that in uh, the area that you're using as the foundation, and then you lay the fresh concrete over it. And thus, you know, you have your foundation. Well, here, it looks like we've got two Akkadian words pressed together. And that gives us this idea of foundation. So the bottom section of a wall, like a piled wall, that's a foundation, a shetesto in um, Aramaic or Syriac. Now let's go ahead and look at our second word. Our second word is ardichlo. And this is a straight up Akkadian term. And if we look at it, you can see it represented in a couple ways. I mean, ultimately we could say, yeah, it goes back to Sumerian. Sumerian has a, another word for servant, so it's basically ear three, as it's uh, conventionally written in uh, the logographic tradition. So there's some, you know, question, okay, is Arad Sumerian or is it originally Akkadian adopted into Sumerian? Um, looks like the root seems to be a productive in the Semitic languages. And if that's the case, maybe we have a case of an Akkadian word being Sumericized, or at least used in uh, Sumerian regions. And so you'll see it pop up in Sumerian texts as well as Akkadian texts. And the next words, of course, A2 and Gal, just mean the palace or the large house. And of course, the large house is later known euphemistically as a temple because there's only 
two types of people who live in palaces, kings and deities. And so um, when we're, we're talking about where the deity lives, we're talking about an egal. Maybe you know it as a haikel in a Semitic language. And so it's another way of seeing how it crosses different lines. Um, and so really the servant of the temple, the person who is, or the servant of the palace, right? Either one, uh, it's this idea that's associated with the person who designs it, the person who is effectively the architect. And, you know, look, that word's a retrojection, I'm sure, but what would you call the person who designs something, right? Like maybe they're not doing the same things as architects are today, uh, the way they design buildings or houses, but they're also doing the things that people did today just with a lot less, right? You know, I mean, they'll have beams, they'll have stone, right? They'll work with foundations, they'll work with walls, and then they'll work with roofing. And so so it's a fitting sort of word. And it's interesting that the word temple is embedded in it. And, you know, you can think of it as temple or palace, but really whoever is designing something, and maybe that could be you know, if we want to get theological about it. I mean, personally, I think it, it was just an imported word and used more generally for whoever designs the building of a thing, right? And maybe that's because simple houses, like a four-room house um, that you would see in in the Middle East, you know, back, you know, from the, I, I guess the Iron, Iron Age, but probably earlier. I, some archaeologists can comment on when those start showing up. But a lot of the homes are mud brick homes. They're very simple. Like I think pretty much most people can make them. So whenever there's something with ornate or elaborate design, it would be probably in some kind of official building, like a palace or a temple. Thus, you would have a servant of the palace or a servant of the temple be the one who you would associate with the one who designed and is effectively the architect. So when you see it used in Aramaic, the idea isn't just someone who builds something or makes something simple, but the one who can design something ornate. And usually it's a design, you know, that goes back to the, you know, how a palace or a temple was designed. So Akkadian words in Aramaic, they live on. What reasons did they live on? Was it just utility, function, you know, common parlance? whatever. Um, you know, who knows specifically? And maybe there's a paper out there some, somewhere that somebody can write about that topic if they want to research it further. But all that to say, we see them and we see them more frequently um, than others. And another thing I want to note between Aramaic and Akkadian is just the languages are cousin languages. So, you know, a large amount of the inventory of the words are the same and they even sound or look the same depending on the declension of the noun because Akkadian nouns decline. Be attentive to that when you're reading Aramaic. If a word looks kind of funky but feels Semitic, maybe it's Akkadian. And of course, uh, you know, I'll do several of these, I hope, um, you know, with your support. And thank you all for the kind comments. You know, I, I really appreciate it. They make my day. So uh, with that, I'll leave you to the algorithmic duties. Like, share, subscribe. Uh, comment if you have a study group, whether it's a language study group, you're a bunch of polyglots, multilingual folks out there of my own heart. Uh, feel free to share these videos. If it's, you know, you're part of a, a church study group or a Bible study group or something, feel free to share these videos as well and provide your feedback. I'm sure um, they may yield some different sort of readings than what you're used to. I do these videos in part to elevate Aramaic. I want to get Aramaic out there and uh, create a large-scale awareness of the language. But with that, we should also elevate Akkadian, and um, that's always a good thing. So thank you, everyone, for watching, and um, we'll see you soon.